Lessons from the Book of Jonah. Lessons from the Book of Jonah. So it's a very familiar story to all of us. You know, a lot of us probably, you know, you grew up in a Christian home, you want to learn about Jonah. And it's one of those stories that they always make in the children's cartoons and then the whale comes along and takes him and then spits him out onto the dry land. So I won't spend too much time on the actual story. Uh, what, I, what I want to spend more time on is just things within the book of Jonah that you may not have realized uh, even though you're familiar with the story of Jonah. So it's a very famous story, but there's uh, great lessons and symbolism in the book uh, that we can reflect on today and apply in our own lives. So we're just going to go through each chapter, just to point out a few things to you. So the first one, first chapter, we are looking at Jonah's sin. We are looking at Jonah's sin. So we see here that the word of the Lord comes to Jonah and, and God basically asks him to do something. But we see there in verse 3, but Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And sometimes, you know, when we're in sin, uh, we, we do things that are, you know, irrational. You know, what, what made Jonah think that he could flee from God? I mean, you remember the psalm when David said, if I ascend up into heaven, behold, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. But sometimes when we're sitting, we're not thinking about that God's right there with us, watching us do everything that we're doing. We think we can get away from the presence of God, uh, but we can't. And uh, just like Jonah thought he could flee from the presence of the Lord with something irrational, we cannot flee from God either. So he tries to flee from God. It says that he found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare thereof. And this is one thing you want to reflect on in, in Jonah's life. Just like he paid the fare to flee from the presence of the Lord, sin always has a cost. Sin always will cost you something. And you know, there was a, there's a famous uh, quote uh, that goes like this. It says, sin will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. And ain't that the truth? So, you know, we think our sin, you know, number one, doesn't impact anyone. We're going to see that in a moment. But we don't think, you know, we think we sin, we sin, oh, what's the big deal? It's not going to make a difference. No, sin always has a cost. It's always going to cost you something, right? And you're either going to pay for it now, or you may pay for it later in terms of loss of rewards. But sin will always have a cost. And I tried to look up who quoted this. I wasn't sure where it came from. I looked up one website, and one website said, ah, oh, it's like Zacharabi, Zacharias. Ravi Zacharias is the one, was the one attributed to saying this. And I'm like, you know, if you know the story about Ravi Zacharias, um, I mean, I guess it's a little bit ironic, right, that this is a, a, a quote that he's <laughs> attributed to saying. But, uh, you know, is that... Not the truth, even in, you know, Ravi Zacharias' life and, and others who have, you know, fallen the same way, where it just starts as small things and small things and builds up and it takes you further than you really wanted to go, it keeps you there longer than you wanted to stay and, you know, it always ends up costing you more than you wanted to pay. So like in Jonah's life, he fleed from the presence of the Lord, it cost him something, he had to pay the fare thereof. And you can see here in chapter 1, the impact of Jonah's sin. You know, sometimes we sin, no matter what that sin is, you know, whether it's a sexual sin or whether it's a drug-related sin or whether it's a sin to do with money or sin to do with a relationship, all types of sins people have in their life. You know, it's not always just like murder and rape. And, you know, you say, well, I'm not a sinner because I don't murder and rape. But, you know, people are greedy. People are selfish. You know, people har harbor bitterness. You know, people do like backbiting at work and all that sort of stuff. So it's all different sins that people do that, uh, you know, that they continue to do and they don't really think much of it. There's always a price. And sometimes people think, yeah, well, this sin's not really affecting anyone. Well, that's a lie from the devil as well. When we get into sin, there's always an impact on other people. And we can see here the impact that Jonah's sin had. He tried to flee, tried to get away. You know, maybe he wasn't around the people that you know, he was normally around. He tried to get away, but look at his sin and the impact here. Here we see that God actually sent punishment towards Jonah, but you can see that, the, that sometimes the punishment on a sin in your life affects those around you, like it did here. It affected those that were in the boat with him. It says, Then the mariners were afraid 
cried every man unto his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea. You say, well, we don't really use this word today, wares, but we do. I mean, Tupperware, cookware, <laughs> a warehouse. Right? So sometimes you see words in the Bible, you're like, we don't use those, we actually do. Uh, cast forth the wares. So we can see here that there is an impact not only on their mental condition, but also it can have an impact physically as well. It can be financial loss because of our sin, and it can impact other people. So what's happening here? They're scared. They're throwing all their stuff, all their merchandise off the ship. <laughs> they're hoping to, for the ship to not sink. But look at what Jonah is. Jonah, verse 5. Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship and he lay and was fast asleep. Jonah was at peace, wasn't he? For we see in the will of God. You know, sometimes people say that. People say, you know, they're doing something wrong. You know, they'll like, you know, move to like a city where there's like no church to go to because of work or something. And they're like, yeah, but I'm at peace. I'll leave, I'll leave my wife, you know, whatever. But I've got, I've got peace about it. Is that how you determine God's will? You don't determine God's will just because you're at peace. I mean, look at Jonah. He's like fast asleep. He's got peace. He's fleeing from the presence of the Lord. He's not in God's will. He's got God's wrath pouring down all around him, and yet he's at peace. So you see, like, you don't judge whether or not you're doing the right thing just because you have peace about it. Right? You might have peace about it, but you may be... <laughs> a completely wrong uh, place in your life, not following the will of God in sin, but uh, peace. That's why the Bible says that the wisdom that descends from above, it's first pure, then peaceable, right? Because you want peace through the truth, not just peace because you have peace about it. Same with Jonah. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Rise, call upon thou God. So I'll skip over this. So basically... They figure out casting lots is like throwing dice. They say, who's causing this? They cast lots, and they realize it's Jonah. <coughs> they say unto him, they said unto him, tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is. So then Jonah introduces himself and basically tells them, well, it's because of me, because I'm fleeing from the presence of the Lord. That's what happens there. So what then happens? They say, what shall we do? What shall we do? So Jonah says, well, if you throw me overboard, then the sea will be calm. Now, obviously, they, don't, they didn't want to murder somebody, right? They didn't want to throw them overboard. So what do they do? They start just trying to row harder because they don't want to throw Jonah overboard. But eventually, they succumb to what he says, and then they throw him overboard, and they hope that God uh, will forgive them for what? they've done, but obviously they haven't done anything wrong here because, you know, I believe Jonah here is actually saying what pray God wants them to do, obviously with the fish and everything, so that's their reaction, you know, they're saying, God, don't lay this man's blood on our hands and all that, and then they throw him overboard. Now, one thing I want you to gather from this, because like I said, I don't want to spend too much time just explaining the story, I think the story is pretty straightforward, but here is, you see here that The way they dealt with Jonah, what I think about when I read this story is, this is how sometimes we deal with sin in our life. Now, if you, in Jonah 1, think of Jonah as the sin in the boat, right? And what needed to happen? They needed to get the sin out of the boat. But instead of getting the sin out of the boat, what did they try and do? They just tried to row harder to bring it to land, but... It was holding them back, wasn't it? So it's the same with the sin in our life. Sometimes we think, oh, you know, I've got these, got these sins in my life that I know I'm just like indulging in or whatever. Um, but you know, maybe I just keep going to church or just keep serving God. Like, you know, that, that'll be fine. I'll, I'll just keep moving forward. And, you know, that's just, that's just going to be something that I just keep for myself, you know, just keep, keep on sinning. But what I want you to think about here is that's often not how it works. You may get so far in your Christian life 
with that sort of attitude, but eventually you're going to have to deal with that sin in your life. And if you want to go further for the Lord and actually reach that land, you're going to have to cut that out. You're going to have to cut it off. Because like here, they rode hard, they rode hard, but they couldn't bring it to land. But you see here, as soon as they cast him forth into the sea, the sea ceased from her raging. So I think what this is doing here, and this is obviously just my opinion and my interpretation of this passage, but I think one thing we can learn from here is how we ought to deal with sin in our lives. You know, we don't just think that we cover up the sin in our lives with good works. We want to do good works to help us overcome the sin in our lives because eventually we want to throw this sin out of the boat, right, so that we can move forward and do great things for God. Because you know what, if you don't, like we read in Hebrews, that sin is going to hold you back. It's going to hold you back from doing great things in your life. So how does it finish in Jonah 1? Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now Jesus explains the significance of this because if you're familiar with your Bible, you know that Jonah is used as a sign for Jesus Christ. That's why the three days and three nights there is significant. Matthew 12, 39, But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, right? because this is where people came to Jesus and said, Give us a sign to prove that you are who you are. And there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So you see how the importance of, even though you, you read through Jonah, it's funny how like, you read through Jonah and you think even the way it's written, it's, it's, it reads like a children's book, you know, and it just reads like a very simple and just like it's quite comical at times. But this story of Jonah is quite significant in the fact that Jonah is a picture of Jesus Christ dying, descending into the earth, like by the fact that he was in the whale's belly. And then three days and three nights came out. Right? So that's the significance of Jonah's three days and three nights, three days and three nights in the whale's belly. That was prophetical of Jesus Christ being three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. <coughs> now in verse 40 here, you see here, uh, for as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly. You say, like, well, wait a second. Because in Jonah 1, the Bible says that he was in the belly of a fish. You say, like, wait a second. Wait, isn't this like a scientific contradiction in the Bible? Because we know a whale's not a fish, a whale's a mammal. It's got the blowhole and it breathes and things like that. So what you just got to understand is, you know, th these categories of animals today, they're just man-made. You know what I mean? Like when we, they categorize species and categorize animals. I mean, these are just man-made categories. But if you define a fish as like something with fins that swims in the water, you can see, obviously, a whale can be defined as a, as a fish. This is why the Bible has no problem you know, calling a whale a fish because if you think about it, I mean, a child, if they were to look at a whale, they would probably call it a, a big fish. <clears throat> so, you know, it doesn't matter if its fins go this way and it, and it breathes rather than has gills. That is a modern-day uh, classification. So don't, don't get too caught up. I mean, if you're new to sort of people trying to point out contradictions in the Bible, this is one that sometimes comes up. It's quite, it's quite an easy one to answer, but just keep that in mind. The Bible does define a whale as a fish, even though our modern day, uh, you know, what are they, whatever they call them, those classifications, uh, may, may call it a mammal. All right, let's go on to chapter 2. Chapter 2... Jonah's judgment. So chapter 1, the sin of Jonah. Now we see Jonah's judgment. Now we see Jonah is actually in the belly of the whale. Now obviously Jonah being swallowed by a fish and then being spat out onto the land. I mean, this is a miraculous thing that happened, right? This is a supernatural thing that happened. Because people say, like, well, how could this happen that you get eaten by a fish and then regurgitated up on the land? Well, it's because this is a 
<clears throat> this is something that supernaturally happened. I, don't, I mean, I don't know, but I don't know if people could actually survive being swallowed by a whale and then being spat out of the blowhole. But if finding Nemo is anything to go by, <laughs> it is possible. <laughs> but uh, you know, obviously they got they got blown out of the whale. This one got vomited up onto the land. But like I said, don't get too caught up when people say, "Oh, yeah." Because it's obviously a supernatural thing. Some people say, how did Jesus walk on water? Well, this is a, a supernatural thing that God allowed to happen to paint a picture, which was a picture of you know, uh, uh, Jesus Christ dying and rising again. But see, this chapter, even though this is Jonah's judgment here, the significance of this chapter <coughs> is, <coughs> is that this is a prophetical passage about the Lord Jesus Christ. See, this is not just Jonah, you think he's in the whale of the belly and he's just saying these crazy things. You, you realise that this, this is actually now Jonah prophesying and preaching God's word. And he is actually, you know, saying the things that apply to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because you see here, he's in the fish's belly. But look what he says here in verse 2. And said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord. And he heard me out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. Now this sermon is not so much about Jesus Christ going to hell. I'll probably preach that another time. But if you didn't know that, Jesus, when he died and his body was buried, the three days and three nights that his body was buried, his soul actually descended into hell. Now what was the reason for that? Well, it's because he had to pay for our sins, right? He had to suffer the eternal wrath of God on our pla- in our behalf, and that's how he did it. He did it by taking that um, wrath of God, and that's why the Bible talks about his soul was made an offering for sin. And like Jesus said, if you remember when we looked at that passage before, that Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now where is that? Is that just six feet under in the crust? No, it's because his soul descended into the heart of the earth and that's where he suffered an eternal judgment. And it gives you a bit of insight because this is what Jonah 2 is about. Jonah 2 is about you know, Jesus and the suffering he went through on our behalf. So he cried by reason of my affliction. He, out of the belly of hell cried I and thou heardest my voice. Thou hast cast me <coughs> into the deep in the midst of the waters and the floods compassed me about. So, see, in this uh, you know, picture, the waters of God, sometimes you wonder, like, what do the waters represent? Well, the waters represent the wrath of God. That's why, like, when Noah's flood came, the water was the wrath of God. Obviously, you know, water can represent other things as well, but in here, water is like the wrath of God. I always wonder, you know, like, baptism, is that what that's representing? You know, like, you, you know, get buried and rise again. You know, like Jesus descending into the wrath of God, but then resurrecting. Um, in the midst of the seas, the floods compass me about. I'm just underlining some passages because I want to compare this passage to another passage I'm going to read to you later. I just want to show you the similarities between Jonah 2 and one of the Psalms. And all thy billows and thy waves pass over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. Look, the waters compass me about, even to the soul, the depths. Closed me round about and the weeds were wrapped about my head. A lot of people think this is referring to the crown of thorns. You know, like, like Jonah, you know, was in there and had the weeds about his head and that's like a crown of thorns that was put on Jesus' head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. You see, like, did, is that where Jonah went? Like, he didn't go underneath, right, to the bottoms of the mountains. Like, he was inside the whale. The earth with her bars was about me. Forever. So you see there, it's like with Jesus, even though he was in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights, somehow, because he is an eternal, his soul is eternal, he suffered an eternity of hell in those three days and three nights. I guess that's one of those paradoxes where Jesus Christ was able to do that. He was able to satisfy an eternity of God's wrath and judgment in these three days and three nights, just like Jonah was here, but yet when he prophesies, he says, the earth of the bars was about me forever. 
Yet as thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. My prayer came in unto thee, into thine holy temple. He says a few other things. I will sacrifice unto thee with a voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that, that, that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spake unto the fish and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Now, I want to show you this psalm and just show you the, like how similar it is to Jonah 2. So Jonah 2 is written by Jonah, right? And you can see that, that it's prophetical of Jesus Christ, right? Descending into hell. Now Psalm 88 is written by David. Right? But look at what it says. It says here, O oh Lord God of my salvation, my salvation is of the Lord. I have cried day and night before thee. Let my prayer come before thee, incline thine ear unto my cry. My soul is full of troubles, and my life draweth nigh unto the grave. I am counted with them that go down into the pit. That sounds familiar, right? I am as a man that hath no strength, free among the dead like the slain that lie in the grave, whom thou rememberest no more. And they are cut off from thy hand. Thou hast laid me in the lowest pit, in darkness, in the deeps. Thy wrath lieth hard upon me, and thou hast afflicted me with all thy waves. Isn't that interesting? Selah. A lot of people think, you know, Jesus, there's, there's different theories, like there, there are people that don't believe Jesus suffered, had to go to hell and suffer for our sins. There are people that believe he went to hell and did not have any suffering. Kind of like Daniel in the in the Daniel's three friends in the fiery furnace, like they were just there, where there was no suffering. And then you have like what I believe. I think he actually went there, and there was suffering, right? Because he suffered in our place, not only physically on the cross, but his soul as well was made an offering for sin. And I think this psalm actually reveals a lot to show that when Jesus descended into hell, it wasn't just there to grab the keys, just there to just like be there. Like he actually was there to suffer on our behalf. <laughs> thy wrath lieth hard upon me, afflicted me with all thy waves. Thou hast put away from mine acquaintance, uh, put away mine acquaintance far from me. Thou hast made me an abomination unto them. I am shut up and I cannot come forth. This sounds very familiar from Jonah, doesn't it? Mine eye mourneth by reason of affliction. All right, so um, I think Jonah says, by, by, afflicted by reason of my affliction. Lord, I have called daily upon thee. I have stretched out my hands unto thee. Wilt thou show wonders to the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise thee? Salah. So if you want to know what Salah is, if you're new to the Bible, Salah. Salah, because the Psalms are songs, Salah is a, like a pause in the song. That's what, I, what I've been taught. It's like a pause in the song. So that's why sometimes when you read through this, the Psalms, there's a Salah, and it's, it's meant to be like a pause between verses and whatnot, but you know, the word is just there and we just read it as part of God's word. Shall thy loving kindness be declared in the grave, or thy faithfulness in destruction? Shall thy wonders be known in the dark, and thy righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? But unto thee have I cried, O Lord, and in the morning shall my prayer prevent thee. Lord, why castest thou off my soul? Why hidest thou my face from me? I am afflicted and ready to die from my youth up while I suffer, look at this, thy terrors. I am distracted. Well, I suffer thy terrors. So I don't know how people believe Jesus, you know, went into hell but didn't suffer because I'd say it's quite clear that he's going down into the deep, into the pit, all that, and suffering there. Thy fierce wrath goeth over me. Thy terrors have cut me off. They come round about me daily like water. They encompass me about together. Lover and friend hast thou put far from me and mine acquaintance into darkness. So you see that, that Jonah 2, Jonah's judgment, it's like a prophetical passage about Jesus Christ and there's some similarities between Jesus and Jonah in that passage as well as similarities between this psalm and Jonah chapter 2. And uh, the reason why it's similar is because uh, it's a prophetical passage about what Jesus did, but prophetical because at the time it was written, it was talking about something that Jesus was going to do. <clears throat> All right, chapter three. Chapter three, we get to Jonah's preaching. Jonah's preaching. And it says here, he goes to Nineveh, and in chapter, uh, I'm sorry, in um, verse 
3. God basically tells him in, chapter, in verse 1 and 2 just to do the same thing and that he didn't do at the beginning that he fled from. And verse 3 says, Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. I just point this out because I, I just think this is significant in the sense that you get an idea of where Jonah is. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey and he cried and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So I just like to point that out because I thought that was interesting for me was, you know, it takes three days to travel across Nineveh. That's a pretty big city if you think about it because, I mean, if you were to walk across Liverpool, I mean, do you think that would take you three days? Probably not. So it's, it's, it's quite a large city. And basically he's going right into the, into the heart of the city, the day's journey. So he's right in the centre. You know, you can assume that in the centre of the city <coughs> is where the CBD is the central business district. Um, you know, Sydney's quite odd because the central business district is like way over east. <laughs> but I guess it's over there because that's where the port is and uh, so the city was established and it grew out that way. <clears throat> but you would think the central business district is right in the heart of the city, like where Jonah is when he got to Nineveh. And he cried and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast. Now what I want you to note here is that who are the people of Nineveh believing? They're believing God. So it's not that the people of Nineveh believe Jonah. And you see, when people believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, when you preach the gospel to them, that's who they're believing. Right? They're believing God. They're not necessarily trusting you. But what I think is great about this passage and might be an encouragement to all of us is that we know that Jonah preached to the people of Nineveh with the wrong heart. <laughs> he preached to the people of Nineveh with the wrong attitude, with the wrong heart. He didn't even care whether or not they got saved physically, this nation. And yet the, the word of the Lord went out from Jonah and it didn't return unto him void. You know, isn't that a gracious thing that God can use like imperfect vessels to preach the gospel? So don't think that you need to be perfect to start serving the Lord. Right? You don't need to have all your ducks in a row. You can see here that after Jonah started serving the Lord that God deals with him in chapter 4. But yet he went even with the wrong heart, the wrong mindset, <laughs> and it still had an effect, right? Because the power of salvation is the gospel. The power of salvation is not you. You know, but if you take the power of salvation, you take the gospel to somebody, and you have the power of God working with you. And that's why the, the true gospel, the gospel of grace, it, it's, not, it's not you that makes it powerful. You know, people that believe in a work salvation and turn for your sins to be saved, you know, they preach the gospel... Oh, I did all these things. I used to do this and used to do that and I was this and I was that and then I turned and, and then they try, their testimony they try to use is the power of salvation. But it's like, it's not me that makes the gospel. The, the gospel is going to be just as powerful, the message, no matter whether my experience was life-changing or not. Because it doesn't depend, it didn't depend on me, right? What, what is amazing is what Jesus did, not about what I did. So here, even though he's preaching with the wrong mindset, you know, it can still be effective because it's God's work. Now, will it be more? It can be more effective, right? You know, your own witness. Like I said, we're talking about the sin in our life, because <coughs> obviously. The sin in his life could hold him back from even doing what God wanted him to do. But when he went to do it, the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast. Now, one thing we need to think about here in Jonah chapter 3, well, a couple of things. One is, what is fasting? See, they proclaimed a fast, and this fast in this nation was actually quite extreme. I don't know if you ever realised this in Jonah 3. But you see where the king takes off his clothes, puts on sackcloth, 
right? So they were even dressed differently, put ashes on themselves. And he says, nobody should eat. So generally when we fast, we don't eat anything. But look at this, he says, beast nor herd nor flock or anyone, taste anything, let them not feed nor drink water. So this fast was quite extreme where they're not only not eating anything, they're also not drinking anything either. And they're not even drinking any water. So what is fasting? What's the purpose of fasting? Well, the purpose of fasting is so that you'll show God the earnestness of your prayers. You know, sometimes we pray for things, you know, and we can always give God thanks. But prayer with fasting is a way that we show God the earnestness of our prayers. Like, do, you really, do you really want what you're praying for? Or are you just throwing out you know, empty prayers? But when you fast, you say, you know, I'm going to fast to pray for something. It's how you get a hold of God. And we can see here in this chapter, I mean, it's an encouragement. You think like, you know, maybe my fasting doesn't do anything. Well, it did something here. So you can see here that fasting and prayer shows that it actually moves the hand of God because it moved God to make a change here. He was going to destroy this nation. And when they turned and they fasted and they prayed, God changed. He repented of the evil that he said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. So it does make a difference. Prayer and fasting makes a difference. This was quite an extreme fast. But if you never fasted and prayed before, that's why I have a prayer and fasting before anniversary, and we should probably have some more. I was talking with Nathan about it. We should probably have it more frequently. But, uh, you know, that's an opportunity for you to do it with other people. You know, it's just like, that's what the soul winning is for. You say, you know, why don't we have a scheduled soul winning time? Well, because chances are most people are not going to just take some pamphlets and then go do it themselves. So we have a scheduled soul winning time. So there's somewhere where you can take part and do it with other people. You don't have to do it by yourself. Now here in Jonah 3, it's a picture of salvation. You know, this is not saying that everyone in Nineveh got saved. Because what's actually happening here? God is going to destroy this city unless they turn from their evil way. The city actually does. We don't know if everyone in Nineveh actually did. Like every individual. But let's say for argument's sake they all did. You know, because it says here, yeah, from the greatest of them even to the least. So we'll say, okay, everyone did. But What's happening here is that they are saving their nation physically from a physical judgment, right? That they were going to overthrow. In what way? Who knows? Like Sodom and Gomorrah with fire and brimstone or with an invading nation? We don't know. But what you don't want to think is this is what they did in order to get saved spiritually, right? So what did they believe here? Right? And because they had to turn from their sins in order to save themselves from this physical judgment that was to come. But how do we look at this in, in, in light of the New Testament, where the New Testament tells us that salvation's not by works, right? I'll show you here in uh, Ephesians 2. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we've got to understand here that that's what's actually happening physically in the Old Testament. But how it applies to the New Testament is we believe on Jesus in order to be saved from the spiritual judgment of God, which is hell. Right, but here, this is a physical nation being saved from a physical punishment, right? If the nation would turn from their sins, and they do. So it starts with the leader, it turns, they turn, they fast, and it moves the hand of God. Now here, we see here in verse 10, and I reference this a lot when I talk about work, salvation, and repentance of sins. Now we can see here that what they did, God actually defines as works. God saw their works. Right? He saw what they did. That they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he'd do unto them, and he did it not. Now why is that significant? Because the Bible says salvation is not of works. So we can't have a passage like this saying that they did this and they got saved because it would contradict this. 
right? So what's happening here is they did this, they were spared physical judgment, right? But what they did was works. Now this is a picture of salvation, but like I said, how do we turn from sins under the new covenant? We believe on Jesus Christ, right? We believe on Jesus Christ, and that's how we get rid of our sins, and then we can have the blessings of God. Now, should we turn from our sins as believers? Of course, right? Should we do that? But that's the works we're doing in our life, right? That's, that's why we should do good works, but we don't do that to get saved. Why? Because by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, right? The turning we do in the new covenant, it's a repentance from dead works, you see here, it's not repentance from sin. This is dead works. It's trusting works in order to be saved. That's what we have to turn from. Right? So that's what salvation is. Romans 10. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Right? What is that righteousness of God? For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Right? To everyone that believeth. That's how you submit yourself to the righteousness of God as opposed to trying to establish your own righteousness by working your way to heaven. All right, let's uh, do chapter 4 quickly. Chapter 4. So we had Jonah's sin. We had Jonah's judgment and Jonah's preaching. Jonah's, yeah, Jonah's preaching, and now we have Jonah's heart. Right? Jonah's heart. We see how Jonah feels about the situation, and we see how God deals with him. And we can learn a few things here. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. And he was very angry. Now, if Jonah is very angry with something God does, who's wrong? Jonah's wrong. So think about that in your own life, in your own opinion. Sometimes you, you think about things that the Bible says or the Bible do, or the God does in the Bible and you, you get angry or you don't like it. Who's right? Who's wrong? Obviously, if we are angry with something God does, we're wrong. <laughs> if we don't like something the Bible says, we're wrong because God is not wrong. So sometimes the Bible will teach things that people don't like. You know, the Bible will teach that homosexuality is wrong, right? And sometimes Christians are like, oh, you know, we, we don't want to say those sort of things. You know, we want to love the LGBT crowd and all that. But homosexuality is a sin in the Bible, you know, and that's something that the Bible says. And people get angry at that, but then who's right? God is right. right? So it's things like that. Homosexuality, things that the world gets angry at. We don't want Christians to get caught up in those sorts of things. You know, thinking homosexuality is okay. Like you start hearing Christians saying like, yeah, but as long as the relationship is monogamous and you know, they get married, they're committed to one another, and it's okay. No, the Bible's not just saying it's okay if it's a monogamous relationship. It's a monogamous relationship between a male and a female. Right? You have a monogamous relationship between a male and a male and a female and a female. It's homosexuality. It's a sin. Roles of men and women sometimes get people get angry at. You don't like that there is a hierarchy in the family, uh, that God would have it that way. Sometimes people get, when we talked a bit about in Jonah 2, like of hell as a punishment for sin. People say, you know, loving God shouldn't send people to hell. How dare you know? How can God do these sorts of things? Well, if we get angry at God when God does something, we're wrong. Just like here, Jonah gets angry with something God did. Is God wrong? No, it's like uh, Abraham said, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? So what's happening here in Jonah 4? It's like Jonah, he gets angry to the point where he even wants to no longer live on the earth. So there's a few thoughts. Like One is you can see how... You know, and even though Jonah's being quite immature here, you can see how it's possible for a believer, a saved person, to no longer want to live. You know, some people say, oh yeah, but if you were saved, 
you wouldn't commit suicide. You know, if you were really saved, you wouldn't have those thoughts and do these things. Um, you obviously haven't read the Bible when people have those sorts of thoughts because, I mean, here's Jonah. You have David many times talking about his despair. You have Elijah, you know, after the prophets of Baal wanting to kill himself. So you see here, you see people that have committed suicide in the Bible. You see Samson committed suicide. You see Saul committed suicide when they were in places of despair. Now, am I justifying suicide? No, I'm just saying, like, don't get these ideas that there are these terrible sins that, you know, believers are capable of doing. It doesn't mean that they're not saved. It just means that, you know, all of us are susceptible to the works of the flesh and susceptible to our sins if we, you know, are not walking in the Spirit and we don't uh, have the right mindset. So we see here that he goes up, you know, selfishly and he's, he's watching the city <clears throat> and even though he acknowledges God's mercy and kindness, He's still hoping that this city won't be safe, right? This is why he's up on this mountain, this hill, seeing what would become of the city. Because he's still hoping that this city doesn't get saved, even though like, you know, physically, because he doesn't want this city to be saved. So what happens? So on this hill, God basically just asks him questions. It's interesting how God deals with situation here. Um, where he doesn't just like really just tell Jonah you shouldn't be angry. He kind of gets Jonah to self-reflect and he asks him questions. He says, then say the Lord in verse 4, doest thou well to be angry? Right, so Jonah goes up and basically what happens is it's quite sunny up there. I think he makes himself some shade but it's not very, very effective. So God basically makes this plant grow up next to him to give him some shade. So then he's quite happy. That's what this gourd is. Right? The Lord prepared a gourd that might come up over Jonah, that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver from him from his grief, right? from the heat and the exhaustion that he has as he's up there. So Jonah was happy. But God prepared a worm uh, when the morning rose the next day and it smote the gourd that it withered and it came to pass when the sun did arise. So now this gourd has now died and now he's angry that this gourd is no longer there. And it makes you wonder, like, what was he angry about? Because people say, well, wasn't he just angry, um, you know, because he was getting hit by the sun? And I'm sure that's one reason why he was angry. But when God talks to him later, one reason why he was angry is that he was angry that that plant had died. Because God says to him, doest thou well to be angry for the God? And he said, I do well to be angry even unto death. Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd. So you see how there he was angry that the gourd came up and the gourd has been destroyed and he, he doesn't think the gourd should have been destroyed. Right? So what is God trying to get Jonah to, to reflect on here? Right? Because Jonah is valuing things based on what they do for him. Right? The God did something for him, you know, provided him shade. So he gave value to the God, and when the God was no longer there, he didn't care about the God. But not the Ninevites, right? The Ninevites were Jonah's enemies. So what God is trying to do here, and what I think God is trying to do here is he's trying to change Jonah's perspective to not see and value things based on what they do for you but based on how God sees them. See, God valued the Ninevites, right? And God wanted Jonah to see the Ninevites in the same way that he saw them. And he's trying to reveal to him here, it's like, look, you didn't even cause this thing to grow up and cause it to, to die, and yet you value the God more than you valued the Ninevites. And this is why I love how Jonah 4 ends, because Jonah 4 doesn't even end on a statement. Like it ends on a question. It's like a rhetorical question. He says, And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six, thousand, six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle. So God is trying to show here like what Jonah should value. Because right? Jonah was valuing the God, and he had his perspective all wrong. 
God is trying to shift it back to valuing the souls of people, right? And valuing and seeing the Ninevites the way God sees them. And you know, that's I think what we gotta do. You know, because sometimes people serve God, you know, with the wrong attitude. You know, they might serve God, you know, because they have to. I don't really want to, but I have to. You know, they or they serve God. <laughs> they do it because they don't want to. They're not really thinking about who they're serving. So I think if we change our perspective, rather than just serving God because of what he does for you, or serving people because of what they do for you, we ought to serve God because of how God sees those people. And I think if we see people the way God sees people, we will serve people and serve God with the right attitude. Right? So people don't need to do anything for you, for you to love them, the way God does. Right? Just like the Ninevites didn't do anything for Jonah, but that doesn't mean that Jonah couldn't love them the way God loves them. I mean, the Ninevites didn't do anything for God, and yet God loved them. Right? So that's the last sort of thought I want to leave you on uh, in chapter 4, is this thought, this thought from Luke 6, verse 27. It says, But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you, Bless them that curse you and pray for them which despitefully use you. And unto him that smiteth thee on the one cheek, offer also the other. And him that taketh away thy cloak, forbid not to take thy coat also. Give to every man that asketh of thee, and of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. And as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. Look at this in verse 32. For if ye love them which love you, what thank have you? For sinners also love those that love them. And if you do good to them which do good to you, what thank have you? For sinners also do even the same. I always find this like so profound and something I always um, just think on myself. And things that I always find telling people as well. You know, when people struggle to just love people that have done them wrong. Or people struggle to love people that you know, maybe don't take as much effort as they do to love them. And I always just think, you know, this is why Jesus said this. If you, if you love somebody because they do something for you, I mean, what's, what's the good in that? Because that's what sinners do. You know, he says, if you do good to them which do good to you, what thank have you? For sinners also do even the same. So I feel like, you know, sometimes in the Christian life, you know, you're, you're serving and you're doing things for people and you enjoy doing it, right? Because they appreciate what you do. Maybe they'll do something nice back for you. And you're like, hey, this serving business is, hey, is pretty good. And then it gets to the point where people don't appreciate what you do. Maybe like you've done something nice for somebody and they do something like bad to you and you're kind of like, I mean, like, and, then, and then what's our attitude? I'm never doing anything for them ever again. Right? But you know what you should be thinking? You should be thinking, man, that is my opportunity to love in the way God actually commanded me to love. Right? To love somebody and to try and do the right thing by them, even though they don't do anything for me. You know, and that's, uh, that's not easy to do. But if you just change your perspective, you change how you look at it, you know, rather than like, like Jonah, like think about how it affects me, think about like from God's point of view. And God loves this person, you know, maybe they did me dirty, but you know, now this is an opportunity for me to grow, for me to love in the way I ought to love. What thank you for sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again, but love ye your enemies, do good and lend, hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great. And ye shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. All right, so I hope the next time you read through Jonah, it'll be a bit more of an in-depth book for you. You know, you won't just think about, you know, Jonah getting swallowed and three days later going up. You'll see a bit more of the life lessons from the book of Jonah. But the last thing I just want to get you to reflect on is, you know, the book of Jonah is, it's kind of like, it's kind of like his life legacy, wasn't it? 
They know where they're going. (laughs) (coughs) (coughs) The book of Jonah, it's kind of like his life legacy, isn't it? And you kind of think when you read the book of Jonah... Sorry, that'll be all right. Nobody else is in there, right? (laughs) Uh, If you didn't see, they just went into the ladies' toilet. (coughs) But um, the book of Jonah, it's like his life's legacy. You, you read through the book of Jonah and you're like, okay, this is what everyone's going to remember Jonah by. And it's unfortunate that he was remembered as somebody that, you know, was kind of unloving and rebellious and disobedient. You know, and, and what, I want you to get, what I want you to think of today is if, if a book was written that had your name on it, you know, the book of Victor, what would, that, what would the legacy of that book be? Now, would you want the legacy of your life to be like Jonah's? You know, where people think of you as a, you were one that fled from the presence of the Lord, you served the Lord with the wrong heart, somebody that God had to deal with, and, you know, and then your life ends with a question of whether did he actually end up changing in the end or not. I don't want my life to be like that. You know, I want somebody to read my life and see, hey, this is somebody that did great things for God and served God. So, you know, what is your book going to read like? Do you, you want it to read like Jonah's? If not, you know, what are you going to do about it? Better have a different perspective, a different heart to Jonah. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for this lesson of Jonah. We can learn so much from all the different characters in the Bible. And uh, Lord, I just pray you help us to take the good traits and, and uh, leave the bad traits. Help us, Lord, to deal with the sin in our life. And uh, Lord, help us to love others the way you love them. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.